Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan. With me today is a wonderful guest, Kevin Attix, a buddy of mine, a colleague in Annapolis that I work with a lot, and the founder of Grow and Fortify. Kevin, thanks so much for taking time to chat today. Honored to be here. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about alcohol uh, for this conversation, in addition to kind of some other stuff. But let's start with you grew up in Bowie. Um, I'm so curious. Tell me about your childhood. When did you take your first drink and did you like it? Oh, geez. Uh, childhood was a lot of fun. You know, back in the 80s, uh, free range kid uh, having a great time and uh, uh, great parents, neither of whom drank anything. And it was probably when I was in uh, high school, had my first sip of beer. So mm -hmm. beer was was number one. Right. Um, and it, 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 it honestly really wasn't until college uh, when I had a roommate that was really into wine, um, junior year, really into wine. And his dad owned a restaurant and would deliver to us all of the bottles that they had to pull off the shelf that, you know, off the bar that were probably, you know, been open too long or whatever. So I don't know the 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 provenance, provenance of these wines, but I learned a lot. And that's what huh. got me interested in it. That's cool. I also had my first sip of beer in high school and just didn't, it didn't take for a long time, no, actually. No. Um, so uh, talk about grow and fortify. It's, uh, um, it's about agriculture and then it's obviously about beer, wine and distilled spirits. Yeah, and 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 real briefly, so Grown Fortify is uh, my and my team's concept of focusing on value-added agriculture. We believe that, um, first of all, agriculture is critically important, right? No farms, no food, no farms, no beer. Um, and, and if our farmers aren't given the tools to make valuable products, not just grow corn, sell corn, but grow corn, make whiskey, grow cows, make cheese, that extreme adding of value is what's going to keep our farms in Maryland profitable. And yes. so um, included in that is, is beer, wine, and spirits. So in addition to promoting uh, agriculture and value-added ag, we run the trade associations for local wineries, breweries, and distilleries. So that's, that's uh, a, a lot of what we do. Yes. So let's talk about the impact of alcohol, beer, wine, and distilled spirits on the Maryland economy. Do you have any data about jobs and economic impact? Yeah, it's 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 actually a pretty big number. Um, so specifically with uh, the alcohol production in Maryland, uh, it's it's over a billion dollars annually when you add in the jobs, the you know direct impacts and effects, and then the secondary. You know, if if you're a brewery, you have a wholesaler. If you have a wholesaler, you have jobs, and you're selling it to retailers, and so. You know, one small brewery has this outsized effect on a small town because yes. they're they're bringing people into the town. They're buying that beer. And then when those people leave, they go to restaurants and they you know go to the art galleries and then they go home and they buy that beer again. Yeah. And that's the same thing with wineries, distilleries. And, and we love that element of it. It's not this job's really not about beer, wine and spirit. It's, it's about all the other things that come into it. Yes. And yes. Okay. And. Yes, Anne. Uh, well, yes, so let's talk right. about, yeah, there we go. Let's <laughs> talk about the role of the legislature because yes. alcohol is obviously uh, a controlled substance and uh, and you guys come to us uh, and as vice chair of education, health and environmental affairs, yes, we do education, we do health and we do the environment, but we also have jurisdiction over all alcohol bills. So why don't you talk about some of the some of the laws that have been passed that have really moved the needle and supported the industry? Well, when you think about, and that's always the first question when people get in, into the industry, why is it so regulated? And it's because of prohibition and we were, we did bad things and we were put in timeout, you know, way long ago. And so, <laughs> so uh, the rule was you can't sell, serve or drink alcohol. And then years and years on here we are now where we've got these burgeoning industries that are still operating in some respects under the old laws 
that may not allow a manufacturer of a product to actually pour a sample or pour a, a glass at, you know, at a winery or sell a bottle at a distillery. And so those are the types of things that we come to your committee and, and your, you know, respective uh, house, house uh, counterpart to try to get bills passed every year that just evolve it a little bit to mm -hmm. allow consumers to do hear what they do in other states. Talk about direct to consumer shipping. That was a big deal a bunch of years ago now. It was a big deal and it was a 30 year bill to get that bill passed. It took 30 years to pass a bill that allowed wine to be shipped direct to consumer. And um, it, it, it's something that is so incredibly well used in the state of Maryland. And there are 30, it was 46 other states that allow direct shipping. And I think- Now, Maryland, why don't you say what, the, what it is? Well, so so direct to consumer shipping is when um, someone is interested in finding a bottle they can't find in their local wine shop. Um, they go online, they find it because maybe they've been to the vineyard, they've been to the winery. Um, the winery has a wine club where, you know, in a lot of cases you can only get those um, those exclusive wines from the winery itself. You either have to drive there or you can call them up and get on their wine club. So um, uh, most Maryland wineries, there's 105 Maryland wineries. Most of them are shipping wine um, because it's such a it's a it's a niche product and it's it's in high demand. Right. Um, alcohol has been a political football over the years and most recently, a couple of years ago in the office of the comptroller yes. uh, with, with the comptroller having oversight. Why don't you talk about the history of that and uh, give us a sense with a new comptroller coming in. Um, have you heard about, as I have, conversations about revisiting that? Well, I, I, I can tell you that um, the comptroller, and, and it's usually a, a comptroller or the, the, whoever the tax collector is in a state, the treasurer, that's usually where alcohol is regulated because it's really about taxes. I mean, that's what yes. it's about. It's about the excise taxes and that. So um, a, a number of years ago, uh, the, the industry found itself in a precarious spot with some legislation and the comptroller, Peter Francho, um, who has always uh, been the one to stick up for the small guy, got involved and, and pushed really hard on it. And actually at the end of the day, moved us forward in a way that, you know, we would have been set back uh, a generation uh, if, mm. if the bills passed the way they needed to be. Mm. Um, but in so doing, uh, the alcohol was basically seen as, um, you call it a hot potato, maybe it's a toy, but anyway, he got his toys taken away and it was turned into a new committee yeah. and a new commission separate under the governor, uh, but an independent commission. And um, that commission has been working great. And a lot of the same uh, inspectors and licensing folks moved over. And so it's, it's been relatively seamless for the industry. As far as the, the new comptroller, comptroller-elect Learman, we're excited to work with her on the uh, comptroller still has the taxation side. The licensing yes. and regulation is over uh, in the other way. So right. um, look, where, wherever alcohol ends up, uh, I think we're going to be, I know we're going to be in good hands because right. of the, the folks who are at the ground level good. managing and inspecting us. Good. So speaking of oversight and enforcement and all that, let's talk about alcohol abuse and driving under the influence, driving while intoxicated and stuff. Yeah. Does Grow and Fortify or do the industries uh, step in on that and how in terms of education and supporting sort of enforcement? Yeah. So one one thing to know is that um, a lot of the problems with alcohol come because of uh, the abuse that's allowed to occur. People are overserved, and they're overserved because you're you're far enough away from the producer of that product that at some point, um, you know, alcohol for better or worse can can be easily accessible and can be uh, overconsumed and oversold, et cetera. Right. In, in our case, you're dealing directly with the not only the owner, but the maker of the product. And so mm -hmm. we find that, um, you know, we ask, we suggest that they all should be alcohol certified. They should all. It's not mandatory, but we think they all should be. We started a program um, to make it accessible to our members. And 
every week we're certifying 30 or 40 people. I mean, it's nice. unbelievable how many Good. want to be certified, but also we, we, we are proud to say that we don't see the, the, the type of abuse of alcohol at our manufacturers because there's, there's a much lower tolerance for it because it's their product. It's their house. They've made this product. Mm. Um, and, and also I think, you know, the, there's the issue of, of these products are premium. I mean, mm-hmm. A local craft beer, you know, a, a good local right. craft beer, it could be almost twenty dollars a four pack. Yep. yep. Um, sixty dollars a bottle for a, a bottle of local wine, sometimes that or more for a bottle of local gin or, or whiskey. Right. So it, it's a right. different right. dynamic, but it's always on our radar because it is a product that can be abused. So we're we're extra careful about it. So we started with agriculture. So there's another product that is grown. Uh often locally, uh, that's being discussed and debated now, and that's cannabis. How do you expect the decriminalization, legalization of cannabis to affect the alcohol market? Are there projections on that? Uh, you know, we, we have we have some limited experience in states, um, California, you know, uh, Northwest, uh, Colorado, where we've seen um, We've seen minor impacts on the sale of alcohol. Um, I, I, you know, our our hunches, and it's just me, you know, my uh, analysis of the situation. I think the larger brands, the more nationally known brands, are the ones that feel that. Not so mm-hmm. much the local producers, because the local producers have a different hook than mm-hmm. just um, come and try my product and feel it or, or go right. try that product and feel it. Uh, right. People are actually traveling to the state yeah. to try stuff. Right. Marvelous. Well, um, I still, I have so many questions. Um, so beer, wine, and spirits, do they complement each other or are they competitive sort of across lanes? Interesting. They, they, they complement each other and, and it's, it is interesting to see how many of each of these industries' consumers are familiar with the other industry's products. So mm. rarely do you find someone nowadays, and I know they exist. I, I spoke with someone today who's, I only drink wine, nothing else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Rarely do you find that anymore. People huh. people are a- occasionally trying other products or they've come to really like you know, gin and Cabernet and yeah. IPAs. So it, it's it's interesting. We find that our industries collaborate. There's so much in the way of product collaboration where breweries are using whiskey barrels and, and wineries mm-hmm. are having their grapes distilled and then bringing that back to make port. I mean, it's, it's so cool to see that. Um, we didn't see that 10 years ago, but we mm-hmm. see that now because of just the cross-pollination and and it's it's great. The customers are going from one to the next. Yes. And, so there's a more more comfort and more awareness. Well, I have to tell you, I'm a huge tea drinker. I've never had a sip of coffee in my entire life, which I know makes me a little bit of a weirdo. But one of my favorite new teas is Harney's Cask Bourbon Tea. And it's amazing. Oh. Uh, so yeah, all that. I'll, uh, be, I'll be coming by for a tea sampling. There you go, for sure. Um, so, so much in the news has been about supply chain. Uh, so buy local, drink local, shop local, grow local, just all of that. So talk about the environmental impact as well as literally getting stuff to market when it's within the state. Certainly growing it local, making it local, selling it local um, is what got our producers through COVID. When everything mm-hmm. was shut down and things were scrambling and everything was topsy-turvy, Um, and you couldn't find things in stores, you could find things in local stores and you could buy directly and you could go to farmer's markets and get just about everything you needed to eat at a farmer's market where you'd go to the local grocery store, a chain store and be running the gauntlet. Um, So, so I think that that is really, I mean, that's a big focus of what we're trying to promote is that, that, that food system, keep that local. Um, keep that local. In terms of supply chains, we still have trouble getting bottles. We have trouble getting corks. These are things that are produced elsewhere. Yes. Cans. Um, we can't get we can't get the right size cans or the right color bottles or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. um, if if we could produce those things 
locally, that would be a game changer. Barrels, yes. another thing. People are waiting eight months to a year to get a whiskey barrel. Interesting. Yep. Yep. So there are new startups all the time. And on the brewery's website, it's sort of the, you know, in, you know, coming soon, basically coming attractions. What does Grow and Fortify do? What sort of support does it um, offer a, a, a startup, someone who just wants to get going in Maryland? A, a bunch, a bunch. So we we love it when someone calls us at the point of, you know, my partner and I have been thinking about X, Y, Z. That's when we love to meet with them because nice. it, it's such a heavily regulated business, not just at the alcohol licensing level, which we talked a little bit about, but planning, zoning, permitting. I mean, these are still relatively unicorn looking businesses to a local bureaucrat, you know, a local, a local administrator. And so we can guide them through, we've got contacts in every jurisdiction. And when it goes afoul, a lot of the work we do is going to zoning hearings, you know, text amendments, cha changing the code, just like we do in Annapolis. We're doing that in, in 24 jurisdictions as well on a regular basis. And that's really where members get a huge amount of value is from that start. Very low membership fee, but we will do everything we can to get you up and running. And, and if we can be there for a ribbon cutting as well, that's icing on the cake. There you go. Is there such a thing as saturation? Too many breweries, distilleries, or wineries in Maryland? Um, you know, there was a there was a shakeout in the uh, late 90s, early aughts, but what that that has changed a lot. And to the point where we have um, you look at a place like Frederick or a place like Silver Spring or, or coming soon in Rockville, where you've got a lot of producers and um, they benefit from each other. Right. Mm -hmm. Because at some point you're not just. You're not just uh, harboring local community supporters and customers. You're bringing people in, and if there's three of you in an area, okay. and a restaurant, and right, I mean, that, and and a nice yep. little hotel or B and B, that's really the draw. We do have towns and counties on a weekly basis call us and say, "Get us a brewery in X." Nice. And you know wh whether whether it's um, you know Aberdeen or places like that that we've worked with recently. Um, right. You know, it, it's a, it, they see the value in that. They think yeah. that that's going to help the town, the community, right. and it inevitably does. So um, I started making a list of some of the Maryland beers uh, that I'm aware of and that I know and that I have tried. And then it was like, oh, I'm going to leave someone out and they're going to be ticked <laughs> off. So when you think about Denizens, True Respite, Seven Locks, Evo, Flying Dog, Waradaka, so many more. Um Talk about the impact then of bringing in a, a really big one like Guinness. Yeah. Tell me, how does that help or hurt Maryland's breweries? Well, I, I, I and, and we go back to that political hot potato. When Guinness yes. came to town, the law had to be changed to allow some of the things that they needed. And um, other, other, other forces um, took that opportunity to try to crimp our industry a little bit. Yeah. And um, what was interesting is our industry was at first a little concerned about having a, a Guinness sized brewery and a Guinness named brewery come into yes. town. They have been a blessing for the industry um, because, in terms of, yeah. well, uh, there's a, there's a, we're doing great on our own. And then you bring a level of credibility in like that, that thinks they're going to be in Maryland and mm. sell here. And then they start collaborating with other breweries and that's raising everybody's credibility. And when you have that level of talent and that level of supply chain management, yes. uh, you know, our brewers have figured out that if I can't get what I need, I may call one of my bigger brethren and find out if they can get what I need. And very nice. often it works out like that. And, and they're so super collaborative. So that's actually worked out. It hasn't always worked out in other states when big brands have come in, but um, Guinness, you know, the mix of personalities and, and the story of Guinness is very different than insert mega beer brand, right? It, it's very different. Um, it, it's crafty in and of itself. Yeah, great. So let's talk about marketing local beer. Yeah. So you know, but folks watching may not know that when I go to a restaurant, I ask, what Maryland beers do you have on tap? Right. And 
the range of answers is pretty astonishing. And my most recent, I can't remember if I told you this, but uh, someone named among the couple that they named was uh, Dogfish. And I said, oh, yeah. Dogfish is in Delaware. Like, Flying Dog is Maryland, but Dogfish uh, Brewery is in Delaware. And she said, well, Delaware is part of Maryland. I had to educate her that Delaware was a different state of the United States. And she actually- A very nice state, but yeah, different. Very nice state, but not Maryland. And it's not the, our jobs. It's not our tax revenue. It's not our prestige and all that. Um, so talk about marketing and I have to do this because I have one at the ready. So you very kindly, after I kept uh, asking and hitting a, a brick wall too often, was you made me business cards, which is please support local beer. And then it makes the case for why it makes such a difference. And I very recently gave that, that restaurant this card and my card to the manager. And I said, you got to do better. You need to have more Maryland beers. How do you educate restaurant owners, hotel owners, and probably more important is customers to be asking for Maryland beers and, and wines and distillers. Yeah. And, and, and it, so it's, it's very interesting. I'm glad that you added wine and spirits in there. So, so we jokingly call that the Senator Kagan promotion card, but that, that is something that a I'll lot of it. people, yeah, a lot of people requested it and, and you were kind of the, the, the ultimate excuse for us to print those up and, and the heaviest user of them. So thank you. Yes. Um, you know, beer, Beer is an easier sell because there's there is a there's a perception that local beer is quality. And so really the issue is that um, sometimes it's hard for a local retailer or bar or restaurant to know how to get it because you know when you're when you're stocking a bar, there are yeah. certain wholesalers you have to work with and certain products that customers just expect from mm -hmm. from your place and so um it can be difficult sometimes to say hey change your mind a little bit the distributors have the beer so you just just ask for local and that's where that card comes into play yeah yeah when you're talking about wine or spirits they're not distributed uh the same way beer is everywhere you can get denizens any any licensee in the state could get denizens or the other brands that you mentioned they're, they're just available mm -hmm. um it's not the same with wine where the prices are higher because it is much more of an agricultural product um, in wine than necessarily beer. Um, it's, more, it's more expensive. You know, it's like going to a farmer's market and, and paying $9 for that little pint of tomatoes. Um, you're me. willing to do it because it's great. And right. they're here. They're from here. Um, right. So, you know, there, there's distribution issues, there's supply chain issues, but um, uh, wine, you know, being the oldest of the, of the beverages in the state, uh, been around the longest. There are perception issues because uh, there's a lot of word that the early local wines were not great, and every state deals with that. Now it's killer wines, just like it's killer whiskey, just like it's you know these amazing beers because the learning curve has dissipated. Um, you know, consultants can come in, you can hire the right people, you can learn how to brew beer, make wine, spirits, come out with a top product right away, right. And, right. and that's that's what's exciting about the industry. It's good stuff. Glad you mentioned farmers markets because that's a great place to find local distilled spirits and stuff. So I've never done this before, but I am going to pivot my camera to show my bar. And I made sure that the Maryland distilled spirits are in front. And I've got Lion, I've got Baltimore's Epoch, I've got Twin Valley Distilleries in Rockville, I've got Sagamore Spirit Rye, and I have Old Bay Vodka, because that's yeah. just required for a Bloody Mary it, it now. Is required. Yeah, yeah. That, Come on, that's thank, what Maryland thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do we get customers to feel good about asking for it? What sort of marketing efforts is Grow and Fortify or the yeah. well, associations doing? You you actually had a hand in this too. So there was legislation last year to do what uh, many other states have done, especially our neighbors who've done it very well, where um, they've appropriated money to promote these industries. And so that's why on TV, you can see during the summer, Virginia is for wine lovers or beer lovers ads on, on network TV. Um, mm -hmm. You're seeing that for New York. You're seeing that for Pennsylvania as well, where those industries are, are seeing a million dollars in promotion each year. So there was a bill last year that uh, you supported and really helped us nail down with some amendments that created a commission. The commission just met 
Um, the commission will receive some money from the tax revenue that comes in from these sales. So buy more um, mm -hmm. and that'll help us promote it more. And then nonprofits can come in and ask for funds to help promote it. Nonprofits include um, the Brewers Association of Maryland, for example. It includes uh, the Dorchester County Office of Promotion. Right? If they want to launch a beer trail for the Eastern Shore, the Mid Shore, they can do that, get ad money and, and help promoting that. That type of awareness goes a long, long, long way. Yes. We also want to create a campaign so that when you walk into a local beer, wine and spirit shop, there is a standard display that is all about drink Maryland, drink local. Amen. And it'll have wine, beer, spirits, you know, all, all over it and cider and mead as well. That's that's the kind of stuff we need. And it is coming soon, finally. So we've got to we'll, educate uh, folks. So I went, I was going to a dinner party and I went into a um I went into a store and asked the owner. Uh, can you show me where there are some Maryland? And he looked at me like I had two heads. Right. He had not the slightest idea. And he starts pointing well, me he, to stuff in New York. He hadn't and contemplated stuff. it. He, he hadn't thought of it. And, and, that's, and that's where we need to come, not just from the consumer standpoint, but if they're going into the wine, beer, spirit shop, they walk in and they see the sign that says Maryland and you're going to a yes. dinner party. Yes. I mean, that's, that should be an easy sell. Good. All right, before we go to Fast Five, yeah. I need to pivot to Dr. Kevin Attix, yes. uh, former professor and author of a couple of books. Why don't you briefly tell us about those? So uh, I, 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 I early on to educate myself because I learned by doing. I went out and wrote a few books about local wine regions, including Maryland, but also New Jersey and the Lake Erie region, Ohio, around Ontario, and then New York. Uh, and Pennsylvania, a little sliver there. Um, so so uh, that's that was my original kind of writing after writing some uh, journalism, you know, articles about local wine. Um, started a, public a children's book. Well, and, and so, so interestingly, uh, started a publishing house, which then became Apprentice House Press at Loyola University, where I hold a faculty position. And so I basically teach book publishing and recently a children's book came out and uh, really great tribute uh, to a fallen officer in Baltimore County and a really great story. And, and the whole gist of the book is that it helps kids through grief if they lose someone written by the mother of the fallen officer and the sister of the fallen officer was an illustrator. And so, oh, my gosh, it was like the perfect combination. There. So, yeah, so that I that, that let's that's, say the name of it in case anyone wants to order it or buy it. It's called The Story of the Dragonfly and it's available wherever books are sold. Perfect. Good. All right. Well, Kevin yeah. uh Kevin Addicts, oh, I almost uh Ke Kevin Addicts, uh founder of Grow and Fortify. Um Fast Five, five quick yep. questions uh and let's see how these go. Um how do you take your scotch or bourbon? Uh, neat. Okay. Number two, what is your favorite non-alcoholic beverage? Oh, I knew that this was going to come up. Um, I wanted you don't to, have say, to say tab. I wanted to say tab. I wanted to say tab. <laughs> uh, my favorite not, this is so embarrassing. Uh, caffeine free Coke zero. That's fine. That's good. It's that's yep. drinkable. Yep. Okay. Um, Question three, is there any alcoholic beverage you either won't try or have tried and won't ever drink again? Uh, I try everything once and I I uh, can't think of something that I've ruled off my list. There was something from Reykjavik that was really disturbing, but I don't remember what it was, which means I'll probably try it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, a non-alcoholic question. What is a uh, hobby when you're not drinking? Oh, that's funny. I'm I'm actually in my wine and spirit room, but may I turn my camera? Yes, yeah, please. Um, I also propagate figs. Oh, I love figs. I, I love figs. Oh, we lost your, your you got muted. Yeah, I turn. have 30, 30 fig plants and about 100 cuttings right now that I'm trying to propagate. That is supremely cool. Agriculture. Okay. <laughs> wow. We'll see, we'll okay. see. 
Okay, that's amazing. Uh, Kevin Addix, founder of Grow and Fortify and author and Loyola professor. Uh, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is a skill or talent you have, something you're really good at that most folks can't do? That most folks can't do? Right. Hmm, so it's not that music composition degree. Um, yeah, boy, that is that is really tough. Um, something that I can do that most folks cannot do is that I've got, a, it's a strange thing, but I can smell a corked wine from across the room before it's opened. So wow, before it's open. The corked wine and I will for folks, find out which wine in their rack like this is corked. Unbelievable. For folks who aren't wine nerds yeah. uh, like Kevin, and I'm not one, but it's when it's been spoiled because it hasn't been stored correctly. And so you open it and it just tastes awful. It's too vinegary or something. Can you say yeah, well, yeah, better the, the, than the that? Cork. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's basically a, a, a contamination of the cork. Um, it came in contact with bleach or it has something, but it has a compound called TCA in it. And it smells like basement or gym socks or something like that. Um, just smells muddy and it. The wine's not going to be any good. And so rather than store wine for a couple of years, if I walk in someone's, you know, wine cellar and I, I smell it, I'm like, let's find it. Let's get wow. it out of here. Amazing. Does it, That's weird. does it, no, no, does it, is it like a communicable disease? Like if you've got one bad bottle behind you, does that mean that the others might catch it or something in some way? Not, not typically, but it is, it is something that if you're, if uh, it can spread, if there's one bad cork in a bag of corks, it can spread that way. Once it's in the bottle, it's, it's pretty good, but um, it's so off-putting to people who are sensitive that it's like, just let's get it out. That is extraordinary. Okay. Well, Kevin Addicts, I love working with you and it was great to kibitz with you today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in January when the Senate reconvenes. It's been a pleasure and I can't wait to get back to business. Excellent. Stay well. Thanks for what you do. Thank you.